<laughs> Since I started the, uh, looking at my brain, as Rob said, we've, I've heard it, my neighbours, farming neighbours sat over there and told me the mob sounds like a bunch of hooligans. Um, and it's got some negative connotations in the name, but I think, so, if you look historically, it's been called holistic grazing, which isn't really some sort of hippie notion. Um, it's about looking at the whole, everything you're looking at when you're planning your grazing, which of course we should do. And I know from my experience that I haven't always done that when I've advised on grazing sites. I have to admit I haven't always done that when I've grazed sites with a contractor for uh, conservation bodies as well, and that I, you know, I could have done better. And I think it's a really good framework for decision making uh, to make sure you're taking everything into account. And I'd recommend you, you, know, you can take a look at that process. So the aim today is to introduce the concept of holistic grazing, a little, look, little look at grazing ecology, Rob's done a bit of that this morning, look, see how grazing impacts on plant physiology and, and what we should be taking into account with regards to that. We can common problems with conventional grazing, particularly looking at uh, constant stocking, or continuous grazing uh, and the problems that causes us, whether we're aware of them or not. And we can look at the potential of holistic grazing to solve some of those problems. I think it's not suggesting that this is a, you know, an incredible life-saving thing that's going to change your world and, and you know, everything's going to be perfect, but it's just, there are an awful lot of techniques in here. A lot of people have done a lot of problem solving and just by exploring what's going on and the innovation that's happening in the mob grazing and holistic grazing community, we can learn a lot from that and apply that to protected sites. So, what is it? Where did it come from, the idea? Um, so about 70% of all dry lands, which is about a quarter of the land area of the earth, is turned into desert. Um, and when you look at the little island that we are, our problems with sites seem quite small compared to the, this major problem that we have. Um, huge carbon release from the soil over the last 200 years, which sort of coincidentally you know, coincides with the increase in, in our atmospheric carbon. Um, huge difference in terms of the stored water capability of that in terms of the plants and the soils, as we've heard this morning. Um, and because of this problem of desertification, Guy called Alan Save, we started work in the 1960s um, to try and solve the problem of desertification. And at that time, everyone believed the problem was overgrazing. So if you've got overgrazing, what do you do? You've obviously got to reduce the number of livestock, because too many livestock is what overgrazing is. So they reduced the livestock, and the desertification got worse, and they reduced the livestock again, and the desertification got worse, and worse, and eventually, um, working for several African governments, unsavoury sanctions have carried out the mass cull of over 40,000 elephants uh, to reduce the stocking rate. It's something that he says is, you know, the biggest regret of his life. And, it, and when he realised the mistake, because after he culled the elephants, the uh, desertification got worse again. So he knew it was the wrong thing to do. He was, he, he, they'd done all the research. They were positive it was right, but it didn't work. And so he then had to look elsewhere, throw, throw around what he looked at and start, start afresh. So he started looking back at natural systems of grazing. And one of the things that he noticed is the stocking density in natural grazing systems. This is where the mob grazing comes from. This is the stock of mobs grouped together by the natural shepherds, <coughs> wonderful quote, the wolves or the lions, or whatever you have, savannah grasslands or, or dry grasslands across the world, the livestock stick together for protection. When you look at the tonnage of herbivores you've got there across the area, that is significantly more than we're used to in our grazing systems that we use. It's estimated from the fossil record that the kilograms of livestock in North America, of large herbivores, was greater before uh, Western nations that landed on North America than it is today, even with all the feedlots and the intensive beef systems. So the carrying capacity of the land back then, it was fertile, it was producing a lot of grassland production. They've got their wall seeds and grasses that grow up here, obviously, on the, um, on the tall, tall prairie grasses, but still. And also, just look at the animal impact there as well. You know, these herds move through an area and it's, and it's trampled, it's muddy, 
a lot of the plant material goes onto the ground. It's something that as a site manager we might worry about um, because of that potential enrichment. But I think there are different kinds of enrichment. And, and maybe organic matter increase in the soil isn't something you need to worry about um, as much as perhaps we do. At the same time as coming to this conclusion, um, he, he reread a book uh, by Andre Lozan called Grass Productivity. I really recommend this in terms of, it really helped me in terms of understanding grazing management and the requirements of, of, of plants and herbs. It focuses on grass, as, it, as is in the title, but it, it really is an eye-opener in terms of looking at that. It's, it's something that was ignored really until that time stage we brought it back into um, the public attention. And, um, and I think the key thing that came from that was the focus on rest periods and how rest periods are not the same for your pasture all through the year, they vary throughout the year and we need to respect those rest periods or we're going to deplete the plants that are there and we'll look into that a little bit further. So there you can see bunched together, cattle mobbed together by, by the predators, some more modern day predators. And so when they implemented the mob grazing, they saw a massive change in the environment where they put it into place. Um, there are a huge amount, if you look on the Savory, Savory Institute, there's a huge amount of, um, that's on the web, of scientific literature, research projects they've done to show this, but just look at the amount of moisture that's kept in the grass, that's how, the, how that's uh, thatched, it's, you know, you've got the deserted pine land on the other side, just the radiative heat from the bare soil and the, and the, the sort of feeding loop that you get from that problem, you know, it shows how important it is to solve some other examples of change through implementing more grazing in dry lands, this is. Perennials coming in within 10 years. Um, that's a quote from Andre Lausanne. You know, before when we had before enclosure, when we had big large open areas, we're always talking about the Cotswolds, um, 350 acres of unfenced land up there. They would have had shepherds with the stock all the time. They would have had to move them, and they would have had to move them to fresh pasture all the time because they didn't have worms, they didn't have um, the things that made them so lazy. And those are our sheepdogs, or our walls now, as the electric fences, which allows us to mob the stock together to create the animal impact and to manage grazing. Um, this is sometimes called management intensive grazing in the United States. It's allows you to focus your animals where you want them, when you want them, and it allows you to give them a certain amount of food in one go. You can measure the amount of dry matter requirements, so you know that you're going to need about, depending on, so for a cow, about 500 kilos, you're going to need about 10 to 13 kilos of dry matter per day. You can measure how much dry matter is in the sward, multiply that over your hectareage and fence off that amount for either one day or four days. Ideally, you don't regraze um, after four days because you were regrazing the, the regrowing plants at that stage. And that's quite a bold statement. But if you think about the amount of carbon that's been released from that quarter of the lands of the world's land area through the desertification process. There's a lot of that atmospheric carbon that we hear that creates <coughs> positives. And I think the potential within this is something we need to spread that message because perhaps because it was called mob sto stocking, there have been some people fighting against this. Grazing's bad in some people's minds, and that rather than the wrong kind of grazing is bad. So people, and particularly within um, animal welfare, extreme animal welfare groups, they're very much fighting this message, so I think it's important. I'll try and go through a bit quicker. That's just looking at the um, impact of grazing on, on a grass plant. It's obviously a bunch of grass. Um, and as a rule of thumb, the plant will try and keep about the same amount of organic material below ground as it does above ground. As it's grazed off on day one, you can see it starts to use the reserves in its root ball and it will kill off those roots. 
And as those roots die off, obviously that's adding, every time that happens, that adds that as organic matter into the soil. It decompacts the soil, uh, it creates fishes and, and things for organisms to move in. And that process needs to happen. It's what the plants require to happen. Once they get grazed, they're designed to be grazed, but they're designed to regrow. If you don't let them regrow, then we're not allowing them to follow their, their natural processes. And then you can see the rest period is what's described after we graze and then you come back. So that's just to demonstrate that grasses tend to have about the same amount of matter above and below ground. Um, I think potentially with regard to the, the amount of um, roots that you lose when it's grazed, that depends on an awful lot of other factors. So if you've got really good soil health, a lot of people looking at it now are finding that it, the, the plant doesn't need to kill off as much of the roots as it would do. So you might keep some deep rooted sections, so there might be a thinning of the roots rather than the, the scissor job we've got on that illustration there. Um, and I think that obviously, again, that's aiding, making sure those root fishes are going down through the soil, decompacting, separating, making it more of a crumb, adding to the humus in the soil that Rob was talking about. So what do we get with continuous grazing? We get even at low stocking densities, animals favour the plants they like to graze, the ones that taste nice and the ones that don't taste nice or don't have the minimal requirements that they sense they need, they'll leave. So if you've got a wetland site with a fair bit of rush on it and you put extensive stocking on it, you're going to get a lot more rush if you have an extensive grazing system, you're going to leave that, that's going to prolif prolif proliferate. Um, but also you've got a, a problem here with your root structure. We, you know, people talk about problems with poaching, how do you deal with that? But I think perhaps we need to think about the resilience of our pastures. If we're con constantly grazing, even if that's after a hay cut for a long period of time, we're not allowing that root recovery, then what's the soil structure like? How deep do the roots go? If it's only two or three inches, then you know, we ought to be digging holes on our sites to see how, how deep the roots go. That has a huge impact on the carrying capacity of the soil. Because even if you go on in the winter and it makes a bit of a mess, the fact that you've got the root structure there and the live plants to sort of decompact the soil means that that's not going to be such a problem. Whereas if you go and make a mess on this site, the recovery is going to be non-existent or it's going to be fairly slow. And the activity. I think the other thing to say is, you know, what what grass, what are the plants that are going to be selected first? You hear a lot, I've heard before people say, oh, cattle are better cultivation grazers because they have a broad muzzle and therefore they're not selective grazers. Um, I don't know anyone who's, who's believed that, who's watched cattle graze when you turn them out onto a pasture. They go over the whole pasture, they go and pick all the lollipops and Mars bars across the whole of the pasture, then they come back and then they start again. And every day, if you're set stocking, essentially they're going to take the best first and their nutritional take from each day's grazing is going to reduce every day they're on that pasture. So if you're trying to look after the nutritional uh, requirements of the animal by leaving them on there for three months, it, that's not a very nice experience for the animal. And by the end of that time, when you're trying to get them to eat those bits sticking up that really they don't want to eat, they're probably not getting enough dry matter to ruminate, which is a you know, absolute fundamental requirement for them. So I think we really have to think about that side of it.